Welcome to part 2 of lecture 4, section 2.1, Convergent Sequences of the Text Advanced Calculus by Patrick M. Pitts. Patrick, this is Dr. Gilbert Iyabi. Subsection 2.1.6 Theorem The Sum Property, or what I call the Sum Limit Theorem. I'm going to refer to this theorem over and over again as the sum limit theorem. Suppose that the sequence AN converges to the number A and the sequence BN converges to the number B, then AN plus BN converges to A plus B. That is, limit as N approaches infinity of AN plus BN equals the limit as n approaches infinity of a n plus the limit as n approaches infinity of b n. In other words, the limit of the sum equals the sum of the limits. So that is the sum limit theorem. Once more, recall the epsilon n definition of convergence. We say that the sequence xn converges to the number x if for every epsilon greater than 0, there exists an index n, uppercase n, such that absolute value of xn minus x is less than epsilon for every natural number n greater than or equal to our n, uppercase n. So we're going to use the epsilon n definition to prove that a n plus b n would converge to a plus b if a n converges to a and b n converges to b. Let epsilon greater than zero be given. Our task would be to find an index n, a natural number, uppercase, such that the absolute value of a n plus b n minus a plus b is less than epsilon for every n greater than or equal to our n uppercase n. Now, as we have done previously, we usually work with the quantity on the left-hand side and put it in a form that we can easily use in the proof. So here is what we do with this particular situation. The absolute value of a n plus b n minus a plus b, applying distributivity and commutativity of real numbers with respect to addition, would give us a n minus a plus b n minus b. Now, applying one of the tools we learned back in chapter one, known as the triangle inequality, this quantity right here is less than or equal to the absolute value of a n minus a plus the absolute value of b n minus b, and we call this inequality one, and we shall come back to it. Now let's go back to our epsilon. Epsilon greater than zero implies that epsilon over two is greater than zero. Again, remember the epsilon n definition. A n converges to a. So by the epsilon n definition, we can find an index uppercase n one such that the absolute value of a n minus a is less than epsilon over 2 for every n greater than or equal to n1. Remember epsilon is greater than 0. So epsilon over 2 is also greater than 0. And in this case, our epsilon over 2 is like our new epsilon just for the case a n converging to a. Similarly, Bn converges to B implies that we can find an index of our case N2 such that the absolute value of Bn minus B is less than epsilon over 2 for every N greater than or equal to N2. If I said my N to be the maximum of N1 and N2, then both inequalities would hold for every N greater than or equal to that n, which is the maximum of n1 and n2. And that is precisely what I'm going to do. So I define my n to be the maximum of n1 and n2. Then for every n greater than or equal to n, I simply repeat 
what I did with my left hand side above where I separated this into absolute value of a n minus a plus absolute value of b n minus b. But absolute value of a n minus a is less than epsilon over 2 for every n greater than or equal to n1. Since n is the max of n1 and n2, whenever n is greater than or equal to n, absolute value of a n minus a would be less than epsilon over 2. And similarly, absolute value of b n minus b would also be less than epsilon over 2. And epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2 is epsilon. Now let's put our results together. We picked an epsilon greater than 0 arbitrarily. We found an n, the maximum of n1 and n2, such that the absolute value of a n plus b n minus a plus b is less than epsilon for every n greater than or equal to n. And that is the epsilon n definition of convergence. Therefore, we can conclude that a n plus b n converges to a plus b n of proof. Subsection 2.1.7 lemma. I'm going to call that the constant multiple limit theorem or CMLT. I would be referring to this lemma over and over again, so I'll prefer to give it a name, CMLT, or the Constant Multiple Limit Theorem. It states as follows. Suppose the sequence AN converges to A. Let alpha be a real number, then alpha times AN converges to alpha A. In other words, the limit as N approaches infinity of alpha AN equals alpha times the limit as n approaches infinity of a n, which equals alpha a. This lemma obviously deserves a proof. So let's go ahead and present a proof for the lemma. Proof. Observe that for every natural number n, absolute value of alpha n minus alpha a can be written as the absolute value of alpha times the absolute value of a n minus a simple distributivity and the properties of absolute value and that of course is less than or equal to the absolute value of alpha times the absolute value of a n minus a alpha is a real number absolute value of alpha is greater than or equal to zero we are given that a n converges to a so what we have here is something that looks like b n and b so we can apply the comparison lemma and by the comparison lemma alpha a n would have to converge to alpha a remember the comparison lemma if a n converges to a and c is a non-negative real number and i have this inequality b n minus b absolute value less than or equal to c times absolute value of a n minus a then b n converges to b in this case our b n is alpha a n and our b is alpha a so by the comparison lemma we are done in other words limit as n approaches infinity of alpha a n is the same as alpha times limit as n approaches infinity of a n which equals alpha a and we're done. That is the proof of the constant multiple limit theorem, and we shall use it very often in this class. Subsection 2.1.8, another lemma. Suppose that the sequence a n converges to zero, the sequence b n converges to zero, then the product a n b n also converges to zero. Proof. Let epsilon greater than zero be given. We want to find a natural number n such that the absolute value of a n b n minus zero is less than epsilon for every n greater than or equal to our uppercase n. But we are given that epsilon is greater than zero. Epsilon greater than zero implies the positive square root of epsilon is greater than zero. A n converges to zero, 
by the epsilon n definition, there exists an n1, uppercase n1, such that the absolute value of a n, this is actually a n minus zero, but you can take off the zero, and we're left with the absolute value of a n is less than the square root of epsilon for every n greater than or equal to n1. This is simply the epsilon n definition of convergence, and we're given that a n converges to zero. Similarly, since b n converges to zero, there exists an index n2, uppercase n2, such that the absolute value of b n is less than the square root of epsilon for every n greater than or equal to n2. Once more, define n to be the maximum of n1 and n2. Then these two inequalities would hold for every n greater than or equal to our new n, the maximum of n1 and n2. In other words, for every n greater than or equal to n, where n is the maximum of n1 and n2, I go back to my left-hand side. Remember what I want to prove? That absolute value of a n b n minus 0 is less than epsilon for every n greater than or equal to n, uppercase n. We have found our uppercase n. Now we just have to verify that this inequality holds. So for every n greater than or equal to n, the absolute value of a n b n minus 0, which is simply the absolute value of a n b n, and by properties of absolute value, that breaks down to the absolute value of a n times the absolute value of b n. But by this right here, and the fact that n is the maximum of n1 and n2, I have the absolute value of a n being less than square root of epsilon, the positive square root of epsilon, and the absolute value of b n being less than the positive square root of epsilon, and the square root of epsilon times the square root of epsilon equals epsilon. Again, let's put our results together. What have we effectively done? We have effectively shown that for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists an index n, which is the maximum of n1 and n2, such that the absolute value of a n b n minus zero is less than epsilon for every n greater than or equal to our uppercase n. In other words, we can conclude that if a n converges to zero, bn converges to zero, then the limit as n approaches infinity of a n b n equals zero. And we are done. We're going to apply this lemma in our next proof. So I want you to remember this lemma. a n converges to zero, b n converges to zero, then their product must converge to zero. Subsection 2.1.9 theorem. The product property or what I would call the product limit theorem. Suppose the sequence a n converges to the number a and the sequence b n converges to the number b, then the product a n b n converges to a b. In other words, limit as n approaches infinity of a n b n equals the limit as n approaches infinity of a n times the limit as n approaches infinity of b n. Limit of the product equals the product of the limit. And that equals a times b because a n converges to a and b n converges to b. And the proof is very exciting. Let's go ahead and look at it. Proof. We must prove that the limit as n approaches infinity of a n b n equals a b, or equivalently, we must prove that the limit as n approaches infinity of a n b n minus a b equals zero. Now we're going to take a little detour in order to get to where we're trying to go. Let's define another sequence alpha n as a n minus a and beta n as b n minus b. Then observe that since a n converges to a, alpha n would converge to zero. That would be a minus a. 
And since bn converges to b, beta n would converge to b minus b, which is 0. In other words, limit as n approaches infinity of alpha n would be 0, and limit as n approaches infinity of beta n would be 0. Again, because a n converges to a and b n converges to b. Now, call this equation 1 and call this equation 2. From equation 1, if we solve for a n, we would have a n equals a plus alpha n. And from equation 2, b n equals b plus beta n. Now, let's go back to our a n b n minus a b and see exactly what we get. So, a n b n minus a b would be a plus alpha n right here times b plus beta n minus a b and use our expansion, regular expansion. We have a b plus a beta n plus b alpha n plus alpha n beta n minus a b and that takes us down to a times beta n plus b times alpha n plus alpha n beta n a b cancels out with a b now i can attempt at proving that the limit as n approaches infinity of a n b n minus a b equals zero so limit as n approaches infinity of a n b n minus a b would be the limit as n approaches infinity of what we have down here a times beta n plus b times alpha n plus alpha n beta n. By the sum limit theorem, I can distribute my limit across. Remember, the limit of the sum equals the sum of the limits. So I can distribute my limit across to be limit as n approaches infinity of a times beta n plus limit as n approaches infinity of b times alpha n plus limit as n approaches infinity of alpha n beta n. And by the constant multiple limit theorem, I can pull out all my constants, a and b, and I'm left with this. Limit as n approaches infinity of beta n is zero, right here. Limit as n approaches infinity of alpha n is zero, right here. And since alpha n converges to zero, beta n converges to zero by lemma 2.1.8, alpha n times beta n converges to, very good, zero. So we have a times zero plus b times zero plus zero, which is zero, i.e. the limit as n approaches infinity of a n b n minus a b is zero. In other words, the limit as n approaches infinity of a n times b n equals a b. Or we can say a n b n converges to a b whenever a n converges to a and b n converges to b and we are done. Subsection 2.1.10 proposition and I want you to follow this proposition very keenly because it is probably the most exciting of all the proofs we have seen so far. Suppose that the sequence bn of non-zero numbers converges to b, where b is also non-zero, then 1 over bn converges to 1 over b. Interesting. And the proof is also exciting. bn cannot be 0 and b cannot be 0. Proof. The strategy is to use the comparison lemma. For us to use the comparison lemma, we have to find two things. Firstly, we have to find a real number, non-negative real number C, and we have to find an index N1 such that the absolute value of 1 over Bn minus 1 over B is less than or equal to C times Bn minus B for every N greater than or equal to N1. If that holds, then, since Bn converges to B, we can conclude by the comparison lemma that 1 over Bn converges to 1 over B. 
two things we need c greater than or equal to zero and n1 in n such that this inequality hold well let's see if we can get that to happen claim there exists a natural number n1 such that the absolute value of bn is greater than the absolute value of b divided by 2 for every n greater than or equal to m1 this is why i said it was exciting because we just dropped the mysterious inequality and we are going to prove the claim once we prove the claim we would then use the claim to prove the proposition okay proof of claim we know that b is non-zero so it could be positive or negative it doesn't matter what it is the absolute value of b is going to be greater than zero so the absolute value of b divided by 2 is obviously greater than zero so why don't i take my epsilon to be the absolute value of b divided by 2 then epsilon is greater than zero by the epsilon n definition of convergence since we know that bn converges to b I can always find an index n1 such that the absolute value of bn minus b is less than epsilon for every n greater than or equal to n1, i.e. negative epsilon is less than bn minus b, which is less than epsilon for every n greater than or equal to n1. And further, that means b minus epsilon is less than bn which is less than b plus epsilon for every n greater than or equal to n1 and that simply means bn is in the open interval b minus epsilon b plus epsilon for every n greater than or equal to n1 now let's look at a couple of cases if b is greater than zero remember b is non-zero it could be positive or negative so if b is positive then epsilon is just b divided by 2 because the absolute value of b would just be b in which case bn would be in the open interval b minus b over 2 epsilon is b over 2 that's epsilon that's epsilon and b plus b over 2 but b minus b over 2 is just b divided by 2 and b plus b over 2 is 3b over 2 in which case bn would be greater than b divided by 2 and that means the absolute value of bn is greater than the absolute value of b divided by 2 we can hit absolute value on both sides because b is positive and we're good now what if b wasn't positive what if b is negative then by the definition of absolute value the absolute value of b is going to be negative b in which case epsilon would be negative b over 2 and that will be positive remember negative times negative is positive so negative b over 2 would be a positive number that means bn is an element of the open interval 3b over 2 comma b over 2 and that happens for every n greater than or equal to n1 and again that means bn is less than b over 2 b is negative bn is less than b over 2 therefore the absolute value of bn would be greater than the inequality sign changes the absolute value of bn will be greater than the absolute value of b divided by 2 so in either case whenever n is greater than or equal to n1 the absolute value of bn is greater than the absolute value of b divided by 2 and this proves the claim so we can continue with the proof of the proposition now let's go back to what we are trying to prove we want to prove that 1 over n converges to 1 over b and we want to use the comparison lemma we want to find a c greater than or equal to 0 and an n1 such that this inequality holds let's look at the left hand side as usual the absolute value of 1 over bn minus 1 over b is the same as b minus bn divided by b times bn 
and we just play around with this a little using the properties of absolute value it will be 1 divided by the absolute value of b times the absolute value of bn and the numerator stays the same the absolute value of bn minus b recall that the absolute value of b minus bn is the same as the absolute value of bn minus b okay so we have written the left hand side in a form that we think would help us in this proof we did let's find out so for every n greater than or equal to n1 recall that we already justified that the absolute value of bn would be greater than the absolute value of b divided by 2 so we're going to use that concept here so for every n greater than or equal to n1 the absolute value of 1 over bn minus 1 over b from here is the same as 1 over the absolute value of bn times the absolute value of b times the numerator which is bn minus b and that would be less than or equal to look at this inequality right here absolute value of bn is greater than the absolute value of b divided by 2 let's play with it a little bit and then come back to this the absolute value of bn greater than the absolute value of b divided by 2 if i invert it changes the inequality sign also that becomes 1 divided by the absolute value of bn which is less than 2 divided by the absolute value of b and that implies this here should be implies and not an equality sorry about that so that will be 1 divided by absolute value of bn times absolute value of b simply means i'm multiplying absolute value of b times absolute value of b so that will be 2 divided by absolute value of b squared so that gives me 2 divided by absolute value of b squared so pull all of these in we have 1 divided by absolute value of bn times absolute value of bn times the numerator bn minus b that will be less than or equal to this entire quantity right here gets transformed as 2 divided by the absolute value of b squared 2 is a real number b is a real number the absolute value of b is a real number the absolute value of b squared is a real number 2 divided by the absolute value of b squared is a real number and it is not negative so this entire value is our c which is greater than or equal to 0 bn converges to b we have found a c which is greater than or equal to 0 and that holds for every n greater than or equal to n1 therefore by the comparison lemma we can conclude that 1 over bn converges to 1 over b and we're done you see why I told you that this is probably the most exciting of all the proofs? Because we have to pass through the comparison lemma and we had to introduce a mysterious inequality, which, by the way, was beautiful to verify. Okay, now let's move forward. Because of that proposition, subsection 2.1.11 theorem, the quotient limit theorem or the quotient property would be proved very easily. Okay, the quotient limit theorem. Suppose that the sequence AN converges to A, BN converges to B, and BN is different from 0, B also different from 0, then AN divided by BN converges to A over B. In other words, the limit as N approaches infinity of AN divided by BN equals the limit as N approaches infinity of AN divided by the limit as n approaches infinity of bn which is a over b so the limit of the quotient equals the quotient of the limits proof the limit as n approaches infinity of a n divided by bn we could write this as the limit as n approaches infinity of a n times one divided by bn and by the product limit theorem i can split this up as the limit as n approaches infinity of a n times the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over b n. 
And since a n converges to a, the limit as n approaches infinity of a n is simply a. Since b n converges to b by proposition 2.1.10, the exciting proposition, limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over b n is just 1 over b, and that equals a over b, and we're done. Beautiful. Subsection 2.1.12 proposition, the linearity property. For every alpha beta in R, R is a real number, limit as n approaches infinity of alpha a n plus beta b n equals alpha times limit as n approaches infinity of a n plus beta times limit as n approaches infinity of b n, which equals alpha a plus beta b if a n converges to a and b n converges to b. And the proof here follows directly from the sum limit theorem and the constant multiple limit theorem. By the sum limit theorem, the limit of the sum is the same as the sum of the limits. And by the constant multiple limit theorem, we can pull out our alpha and our beta and we are done. So I'm going to leave the complete proof as a simple exercise for serious students. Next, let's define a polynomial. For a non-negative integer k and real numbers c0, c1, right up to ck, the function p from r to r, r is the set of real numbers defined by p of x equals summation i from 0 to k, ci, xi, for every real number x is called a polynomial. And if ck is different from 0, then p is said to have degree k, i.e. p of x is the same as c0 plus c1x plus c2x squared plus c3x cubed plus plus ckx to the k. Now, if a n is a sequence, then p of a n would be replace x with a n, c0 plus c1 a n plus c2 a n squared plus c3 a n cubed plus plus c k a n raised to the power k. Now we can talk of the polynomial properties subsection 2.1.13. If a n converges to a, then for any polynomial p from r to r, p of a n converges to p of a. i.e. the limit as n approaches infinity of p of a n equals p of a. The proof again is very simple. It follows directly from the linearity property, which follows from the sum limit theorem and the constant multiple limit theorem. But let's just go ahead and show that here a little. Proof. Limit as n approaches infinity of p of a n, we know what p of a n is. By the sum limit theorem, the constant multiple limit theorem, the product limit theorem, which permits us to infiltrate a n squared, a n cubed, a n to the k, we have c0 plus c1 times the limit as n approaches infinity of a n plus c2 times the limit as n approaches infinity of a n, all of that squared plus, 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 ck times limit as n approaches infinity of a n raised to the power k. But a n converges to a, so that is simply c0 plus c1 a plus plus c k a, and that is just p of a. So p of a n converges to p of a, and we are done. And that brings us to the end of lecture 4. Thank you very much, and I look forward to sharing section 2.2 with you. God bless you, in Jesus' name.